Welcome everyone, welcome to Virtual SOAS. Uh, my name is Lucia Dolce, I'm a reader in Japanese Buddhism uh, here at SOAS, and I'm speaking to you today as the convener of the MA program in Buddhist studies. So what I would like to do today is to, um, to speak, to, well, to, to do a bit of what you have been um, told that, that will happen here, there will be uh, a um, very short uh, um, mini lecture on one uh, a theme that per pertains to Buddhist studies that you see uh, uh, the title of uh, uh, just on the screen, we'll be talking a bit about Buddhist bodies. And then I'd like to uh, take questions, but also make a bit of space to speak about the program in uh, uh, Buddhist studies, um, as you may have more questions about that. Uh, and uh, I'll be helped here by my colleague, uh, Stefania Travagnino, would be, uh, with the two of us would be uh, responding to your questions, hopefully. So without uh, uh, further ado, I'll start uh, speaking. Um, and I would like to start my topic with a premise on uh, what is Buddhist studies and how we look at Buddhist studies as a field of inquiry. I'd like to make just some uh, general points about um, methods and, and content. Uh, first of all, I think we should look at this field uh, in, a, in an interdisciplinary way as it is uh, an area of inquiry that can be approached uh, uh, from a philosophical, historical, textual, ritual, or material culture perspective. And each of these perspectives would be uh, bringing a specific methodological uh, um, tool, specific methodological tools with it. Uh, but what joins all of them is a, a critical approach that means also attention to the development of scholarship. Uh, both in the West, where we are located, and in uh, the East. And I uh, think here at SOAS especially, we are very uh, keen in uh, highlighting the importance of the input of Asian scholarship in shaping the field. This is very important really for Buddhist studies. Um, so uh, within this uh, general uh, approach, general perspective, um, what I think uh, is important to remember of how we uh, deal with Buddhism at SOAS is uh, a contextual approach that uh, is a non-confessional approach, but appreciates Buddhism as a living religion. And uh, uh, the contextual approach is uh, uh, favored, facilitated uh, by the fact that we teach uh, based on uh, uh, our own research, both uh, research on primary sources and first-hand knowledge of the field. So what does this mean um, in terms of what, what actually happens uh, when we study Buddhism? This means, um, among many things, uh, attention to the diversity of Buddhism in its historical and geographical developments. And uh, um, I think it's important to take into account uh, both local expressions of Buddhism and uh, what we can call the transnational dimension of it. If you were already uh, coming in when I was talking with Stefania, we we're talking about different classes we were teaching that seemed to um, uh, resonate in the topics that we were uh, dealing with. Um, the, to, to, to pay attention, to the diversity and to both transnational and local aspects means also to deal with the apparent ambiguities and contradictions in speaking about Buddhism. We speak about Buddhism very often in the singular, but is there a single Buddhist or are there many Buddhists? Um, this is a, a point that uh, we will uh, uh, find uh, uh, we have to uh, face whatever topic we deal with. Um, and I hope to show one example in a minute. Um, what also this means is to pay attention to uh, uh, not only uh, the philosophical dimension of Buddhism that is often understood to be the core of, uh, um, of this tradition, but also to all sorts of other issues that we may uh, generally call political uh, uh, issues. So to speak about the theories of liberation within uh, Buddhist uh, um, scriptural and uh, um, 
expressions, physical expressions of Buddhism, but also the extent to which Buddhism in different ways engaged and engages with the political world, the construction of gender, the understanding of environment. So that's my premise. And having uh, uh, placed uh, the, the topic I want to speak with, uh, about within this, uh, uh, this field of inquiry, I would like you to consider a bit uh, uh, the, the problem of Buddhist bodies and to see uh, the body in Buddhism as uh, um, an object of, of uh, uh, practice and of inquiry that is uh, um, synonym with both transience and liberation to terms so that we can perhaps think are the opposite of the spectrum of uh, uh, experiences. I think the body in Buddhism uh, occupies a very ambiguous position at the crossroad of apparently contrasting conceptual stances. Uh, but it cannot, but this, this thing that we call the body cannot be um, considered uh, outside of what I think is a fundamental goal of Buddhism, that is transformation, spiritual, practical, um, improvement that we call transformation. So I think we find two, uh, so these two, this ambiguity that I'm speaking about uh, is uh, uh, played between two different interpretations of the body. Then we may want to associate to two different areas of Buddhism, um, I don't know, Asia, uh, Indian Buddhism and East Asian Buddhism or early Buddhism and uh, the development of Buddhism, but that maybe we can find a uh, uh, we can think of uh, more as positions about the body. On the one hand, we have a rejection of the body. Um, the body, as much as it is uh, uh, born, uh, is a symbol of suffering, a suffering that encounters uh, um, different types of uh, 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 pains that are described in early text. The physical constituents of the body seem to uh, indicate its uh, uh, finitude and its limitations. The same, in the same way, because the body is born, because the body is the uh, um, vehicle of someone who is born in this world, was born um, and is conditioned by what we call karmic causes. Uh, it is, it, this means that the body is limited in its actions and it is, uh, um, subjected to the chain of life and death. This chain of life and death that continues uh, being born and dying and being reborn um, is what makes the, the body suffering. Well, we have extraordinary uh, expressions uh, in uh, some Buddhist texts, in some Buddhist scriptures that speak of the moment of birth as a terrible moment, but also that speak of uh, the, uh, uh, the embryo, the, uh, the fetus growing in the, uh, in the womb as, uh, a, 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 as, uh, as something that is subjected to physical violence, to a, a place that is dirty, that is considered to be um, a, a symbol of, uh, of, of suffering, of delusion. And in all of this, uh, what comes up more uh, explicitly is the duality to which the body is subjected. The duality between being and dying, the duality between uh, the subject and uh, what we can call in an object, the, the naming of a body and so on. Having said that, we also find perhaps in, uh, again, as I, in other traditions of Buddhists, um, an almost completely opposite um, understanding of the body, the body as a site of salvation. In these traditions, we would find um, the, uh, the, the this, this thing that we call the body represented as uh, the preeminent vehicle for overcoming finitude and the expression itself of Buddhist attainment. Uh, when I speak about Buddhist attainment, I speak about this, this big word that we often find uh, indicated as enlightenment, or we can say more broadly, liberation. 
In other words, it is through the body that those that same chain of multiple rebirths I was talking about that causes suffering is through the body that this chain can be eliminated. Um, we get to uh, so to the ex to the uh, let's say the extreme opposite in uh, some Buddhist traditions, for instance, in Tantric Buddhism, but also in many East Asian traditions, where uh, uh, the body becomes the uh, place, uh, uh, the body, the physical body, not a an ideal body, uh, not a transformed body, but the physical body, the body that our scriptures say, the body that one receives from mother and father, uh, becomes the vehicle uh, for the attainment of Buddhahood, which is the ideal status of a Buddha. Um, so, what can we say? Uh, how can we uh, uh, subsume these two, two uh, different opinions about the body? We can perhaps suppose it to the body as a, a liminal space. I was saying that the body is a, a liminal space that exists between uh, time and eternity. And I think that the, the very liminality of the body establishes it as a site of transformation. And what we see, so let's look a bit at how this transformation takes place. Um, I think we need to take into account that uh, uh, besides the general um, ideas that I've given you, there are a, a number of factors that become much more, uh, let's say, technical um, to understand what's the positioning of the body. Uh, first of all, what is in general the conception of reality in each of the uh, um, traditions of uh, uh, lineage forms of Buddhism that we are talking about. Uh, second, the understanding of the Buddha's bodies, which are always seen uh, in interaction with the body of the practitioners of Buddhist. And, uh, uh, and this leads to also to a number of formulations that see sentient and non-sentient beings in some cultures as the Buddhas. So it's a complex of, of factors that allow us to say, uh, to think of the body in these terms. And uh, what, what is interesting, what is important to highlight is that that duality that I was talked, uh, that I was talking about is, uh, uh, is very often uh, resolved ritually. It is through ritual that it is possible to transform the ordinary being into the Buddha, into the Tathagata. And this, uh, in order to do this kind of ritual transformation, uh, what is needed is the body. So how, it, so what kind of examples can uh, we give of this transformation? I thought I would take an example, two examples actually, from uh, research that I've done recently on uh, actually on manuscripts, on 13th century uh, manuscripts that have been unveiled from Buddhist temples. And one example um, consists in practices of visualization. We speak of, often of meditation in Buddhism, but uh, um, meditation, well, another term um, that indicates a slightly different dynamic is, is that of visualization. So these practices of imagining, of recollecting, imagining um, something. And what we can, uh, what we see here in this little uh, strange image that I've put on the screen, this little uh, um, human figure, a, a sexuated human, uh, human figure, is a kind of diagram that indicates to the practitioner what to visualize. And instead of visualizing these, these are deities, these are uh, all um, deities from the uh, pan, if I can call that that, from the pantheon of tantric Buddhists, uh, there are 15 of them. And uh, they are visualized at different, uh, on different parts of the practitioner's body. And uh, uh, so th that, is, that is again, uh, the diagram you could say is the diagram of the practitioner who, who had to learn how, what to visualize or not. And through this uh, visualization, um, through different steps of this, visual, this practice of visualization, 
what happens is that the, uh, um, the practitioner reproduces the Buddha body. And this is what the scriptures will tell us that it happens. And, uh, and there, are, uh, diff there are different things that happen that are indicated in this uh, uh, little image um, that, that is all inscribed with Chinese characters um, that say, for instance, that uh, the, the, the body of the practitioner is divided in three, reflecting the three aspects of the Buddha's bodies that are known in the Mahayana tradition of Buddhism, one of the traditions of Buddhism. Um, it is also this, this uh, um, meditation, this uh, visualization uh, is also used in a ritual of uh, uh, consecration. So the ritual in which in a practitioner is consecrated, uh, is initiated and consecrated initiation and consecrations are two segments of practice in Buddhism that have in, in a specific uh, uh, tradition of Buddhism that are very much related. What happens here is that uh, um, through this ritual intervention, the body is marked and modified by inscribing it with letters that are understood to be the essence of deities and uh, the deities, the, the many accessories of the deities. And it is in this operation that the body is transformed into a body that is described as being the original body. What does it mean in the original body? It means the body that was before the discriminatory moment of birth. Body that is before that coming into a world that is made of distinctions, that means duality. Distinctions are duality. To call someone that means to, to place a subject and an object. And this is what we understand as a duality. Uh, so, but this body that is recreated ritually through visualization becomes the body of origins that is the same as the Buddha body. And very much linked to, these, uh, to this, these ideas, um, I'd like to, to, show, to share with you another, another uh, little strange <laughs> uh, diagram that sees uh, this process uh, of uh, uh, embodying the Buddha, em embodying Buddhahood into one's own body as a process of gestation of a sentient being. These little figures that you see there, these five different forms are a sort of um, um, summary of different steps of the uh, uh, of the fetus inside the body uh, inside the womb and finally the coming out of a um, of a body in this of a body that is that of a Buddha it looks a bit like a Buddha looks a bit like a statue of a Buddha right this one thing so what does this tell us is that um that womb that I described at the beginning of my talk as something dirty, as something that um, uh, uh, makes the, the fetus suffer and that, and that final moment of birth, that is a moment of coming into this world and then sharing the karmic suffering of rebirth becomes in this other tradition, a moment of enlightenment, a moment of transformation that produces the perfect body, the Buddha, the body, the. Uh, Buddha body being a symbol of perfection. Now, what is very much interested with these ideas is that in order to develop them, uh, our Buddhist, um, I mean, I'd say our Buddhist, this again is another, um, something that comes out from another uh, 13th century uh, set of documents. But what, what, what happens there is that they um, open up uh, their knowledge um, or, they, or better, I should say, they draw up their knowledge from fields that we are not used to, to consider Buddhist. Uh, in this case, medical knowledge. When we read these images, we see that uh, a lot of uh, Indian medical knowledge that was uh, uh, transmitted outside of the monastic context is, uh, uh, is taken on and is used to, to understand what kind of development can take place um, within a within the life of a practitioner. So uh, we see in this very very uh, summarized way that there is uh, um, uh, there are a lot of the, um, a lot of 
types of knowledge that come into being in, in, trying, to, um, in trying to understand uh, what a Buddhist text tells us. Uh, there is an intersection of uh, systems of knowledge, but there is also an intersection between uh, the doctrinal context and the ritual context, as after all, uh, knowledge in Buddhism has to be embodied in order to be enacted in order to be uh, uh, fruitful, to be efficacious. And with this, I'd like to uh, conclude my little talk. And again, apologies if um, we had uh, this big break. So uh, I'd like to ask now, do you have any question about the uh, talk itself? And if so, please um, do uh, tell us. Do, I don't see any in the q and I I think you said that they have to be yeah so if, if you can write in the q a we have one question that maybe um oh, yes. fahima could speak to and it's it's on what is student life like in at soas um the student life right now is a bit weird because of the pandemic but there's a lot of societies that you can be a part of i personally am part of the Uyghur society and um, volunteering with the Refugee Crisis Society. Um, there's a lot of, like, as um, Lucia said, there's a lot of different people and you meet a lot of different people and you um, learn a lot of new things. That's one of my favorite things about SOAS. All the people I've met, it's really broadened my horizons because there's things that I didn't know and I, people I didn't think I would be able to meet. So that's why I like SOAS. Um, there's, where SOAS is situated, there's a lot of, like, um social spots and um you can go out with your friends and stuff like that so that's another good thing about SOAS and if whatever you're passionate about there's always something there for you to be a part of you can make your own society um I volunteer with the fire brigade and SOAS has been really supportful supportive of that and um all the teachers all the lecturers the professors are really understanding you meet people with um like-minded views and a lot of opinions and you learn like a lot of new things so that's another great thing about SARS um if there is anything else but I think I've covered it all yeah, thank you. <laughs> that was great thank you um any other questions anyone um so there is one that says um I was wondering if you could briefly talk about my own background and why I decided to take up Buddhist studies. Oh, that's uh, uh, <laughs> that was a long ago, so long ago. <laughs> um, I um, I was interested in um, um, I was interested in philosophy originally, and um, I grew up in a in a country where you study philosophy in high school. I am originally Italian. And uh, um, I thought I knew everything about Western philosophy and I wanted to know how other people think. That was my very original uh, moment. And I was very fortunate that I was also interested in languages. And um, I, was, I was very fortunate that uh, I decided to do, um, to, to study uh, East Asian languages, uh, Jap Japanese in particular. And, uh, um, and within that, I uh, major in Buddhist studies, well, in basically in uh, religions, what was used to be called something like religions and philosophy of, uh, of uh, East Asia. So that was my first impact. So my very first uh, um, interest in Buddhism uh, was, well, as I said, I work on Japanese Buddhism uh, with um, a lot of uh, connection. Well, yes, yeah, so a lot of stuff on East Asian Buddhism, on the, on the type of East Asian Buddhism, um, so Chinese Buddhism, basically, with a little bit of Korean, really a little bit, um, that is of interest to, to, to topics I do. And uh, um, so my first interest was more, uh, more philosophical or doctrinal, but I moved pretty quickly in, uh, um, in uh, a, 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 well, so, a, a related fields, let's say. I'm uh, very much interested in both of the ritual 
uh, context of Buddhism and uh, the uh, visual dimension of Buddhism. Um, so I'm um, uh, bringing both uh, um, uh, concerns uh, uh, to my study of Buddhism. That helps. Thank you. I wonder, so is there any other question? If not, I wonder whether you want to hear a bit more uh, about the program. So I had prepared also a bit about that, thinking that that there would be an interest. We don't have to do that, but um, let's see what the audience thinks. So. I mean, I, I would say go for it just because the, the space to communicate is the Q&A. So yeah, if you have it's more- Yeah, very difficult, uh, yeah. Okay, I think I'll, uh, I'll do that then. Um, so uh, the MA Buddhist Studies at SOAS, um, it's, uh, it's the most comprehensive program we have in the UK. It is uh, a pretty unique study path because uh, it is both uh, coherent, internally coherent, but also flexible. And it is set in a, uh, a vibrant research culture. Um, Fahima was talking about the general culture of SOAS, but what I want to stress here is the provision beyond the curricular pr pr provision that we offer in terms of uh, seminars, workshops, international conferences. Uh, in details, uh, the context is uh, 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 the context of the MA is the uh, School of History, Religions, and Philosophy within which it is uh, host, housed. And uh, uh, this means that uh, uh, together with Buddhism, uh, there is a, a pretty large uh, range of regional and uh, disciplinary expertise on religions. At the same time, the MA is supported by extensive language teaching that includes most of the languages of Buddhist, uh, both classical languages and some of the uh, spoken languages. And um, it's supported by an active uh, research center uh, that offers many opportunities to engage further with the study of Buddhism, especially when we are going to be on campus, I must say. Um, so the core teaching team and with the studies is uh, uh, made by myself and uh, uh, Dr. Travagnini that you see here with us who works on China and Professor Urish at, at the moment is the head of the department who works on India and Tibet. But we also have uh, two specialists in Buddhism in the art history department, uh, one working on Tibet and Himalaya and one working on uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, yeah, Southeast Asia. And you have the names there. Um, the structure of the MA, and I'm talking first of all uh, about the um, the MA in one that you do in one year, uh, or which you can do in um, as a part timer in uh, two uh, or three uh, years. Um, you need to take the equivalent of 120 credits plus a dissertation. What does this mean? Uh, you will be choosing one, uh, you, you will have to do a one course that is called the core course, and that is a, a sort of introduction to a concept in Buddhist studies, it's, it's called critical concept in Buddhist studies, and it's co-taught uh, by uh, a number of us, well, myself, I convene the course, but Stefania will be also teaching in it, um, and also uh, Dr. Litsantes, who is the art, art historian working on the Himalaya, um, and then the rest of the courses are chosen from a list of 15 and 30 credit courses. Um, now, the, what you have at the moment, if, if you have already looked at the website, uh, the website has not been updated, unfortunately. So uh, I would invite everyone uh, interested here to look at it in a couple of weeks time. Apparently, that's what I hear from the offices when it will be uh, updated. But what we have, what I have here are the courses that we will for certain teaching. Um, so I said already the critical concept of the studies, which is the core course. And then you have a range of modules on Buddhism that reflect uh, a, a regional um, varieties, let's say, um, but also dif are different in terms of, uh, um, uh, of the approach. Uh, we have Buddhist meditation in India and Tibet, East Asian Buddhist thought, uh, Chinese Buddhism and uh, religious practice in Japan. Um, so these are the modules that are specifically on Buddhism. 
Then there are a number of modules on related traditions or comparative perspectives. Um, and we will, I, I put it here because they are the most commonly um, um, used or interest, uh, of use to students. Um, the great tradition of Taoist religions of ancient India and uh, the origins of yoga. Uh, there are uh, modules in art history for the coming years. There will be a, a module on the uh, maritime silk route, uh, route uh, interpretations of mandalas and Southeast Asian art history that are relevant to Buddhism. So, uh, and, and the languages I mentioned earlier on, we offer uh, languages at different levels. Um, basic, intermediate, advanced, depending on your abilities and depending on the language as well. Um, the languages are not taught within HRP, within, within our department, but they are in the language, there are two language departments at SOAS. Um, I, think of, I think I have them all there. We will have for next year Sanskrit, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Burmese, Vietnamese and Thai. I also have to say that from uh, next year, um, I mean, from, from now, but again, the web page has not been updated. We have a, uh, an option, a two year MA, uh, Buddhist Studies and Intensive Language, uh, where there would be um, a much more um, intensive exposure to language, including a summer school in the country where you uh, learn the language. Uh, the, uh, language currently offered for this program are uh, only Japanese, Korean, and Southeast Asian languages. But hopefully, in the future, there will be others. Um, this, the, the structure of the MA is more or less the same, except that uh, since there are more language courses, uh, uh, language credits included, um, the, the um, learning is uh, spaced uh, over two years um, in which the, the first year you would learn a, an equal number of uh, uh, um, credit uh, bearing courses in the language and the discipline then you have the summer in which you add uh, um, language instructions and then the second year less language and more credits in the discipline plus the dissertation um, so how do you how do you build uh, let's say a uh, an individual curriculum? Um, and I wanted to give you an example, and I, I took the example of Buddhism in Japan because it's my my field and it's uh, easier for me to do that. So you would take uh, um, on top of the core course that is the course that everyone has to take. You will take uh, um, a main unit that in this case is religious practice in Japan. That is a an overview course that brings together both the historical and contemporary analysis. Then you do a a kind of monographic course so that is East Asian Buddhist thought that are both very much uh, related to Japan. Then you can choose from a pool of optional courses, either on Buddhist or on Japanese culture. So for instance, you can take up uh, specific religious themes such as the visual expression of mandalas or specific religious traditions that are connected in Chinese Buddhism or Taoist um, the primary languages of Japanese Buddhism, in, in this case, classical Chinese, classical Japanese, or modern Japanese at all levels, or any course that is related to history, anthropology, or arts of Japan. So you see what I mean here when I said that you have at the same time some um, uh, coherence, but also a lot of flexibility to um, what to provide for the very diverse cohort of students that we have. Uh, we will have students who are very, um, uh, that already know very well uh, parts of Buddhism and others who are, um, who have been much less exposed to, to the tradition. Some that have an interest in a regional uh, expression of Buddhism and some that want to do a much more broad overview of the entirety of Buddhism. Um, I, uh, Fahima was mentioning our resources around SOAS. I think that uh, it would be really important to make the most of SOAS. Uh, we have one of the most incredible libraries for the study of Buddhism, well, for the study of Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, the, the, the SOAS uh, uh, website, I would say, but especially for Buddhism. And we also have uh, a great resources in the Bloomsbury area. That's the area where SOAS is located in terms of uh, um, uh, both 
uh, libraries and museums. Both the British Library and the British Museum have extensive collections in Buddhism, and uh, uh, we very often organize things together. And then last but not least, all the uh, extracurricular um, um, events that we organized, that I was mentioning earlier on, and uh, I want to uh, flag out at least the two uh, activities. We have a very active Center of Buddhist Studies um, that I'm also directing for all my sins. And uh, um, within this uh, uh, center, we have uh, um, a range of activities. Two uh, lecture series um, that I'll say in a minute. Um, op maybe I didn't put, yes. Uh, open public events that are not meant for academics only, but also for the uh, for the wider public. Uh, a yearly postgraduate workshop to which MA students are organized, um, and in fact, uh, just for MA students, we also have a prize for outstanding uh, MA dissertations, uh, a small prize that you may uh, uh, certainly be interested in. Um, the two lecture series, just to give you an example, are of two types. One is called the Buddhist Forum, which is one of the uh, um, most, uh, the oldest uh, series of lectures on Buddhism in the UK. Um, and it's normally what happens is that we will have a venue for international scholars, you know, all those uh, authors that you would be reading in your in your courses. Um, and or, or but also uh, lo more local academics uh, to present their latest research. And the second series is specific to Chinese Buddhism. It's, uh, it's called the Robert Hall Family Foundation Lecture Series in Chinese Buddhism that has the events uh, per year and uh, consists of a, a public lecture plus a, um, a, a training um, workshop, a, a kind of seminar for postgraduate students uh, and researchers. Um, and in fact, the next one is this weekend. So if you are interested, you can uh, zoom in. The notice will be on the uh, website of the center. Uh, it will be on uh, contemporary uh, Chinese practice, uh, uh, lay practice. It will be a lecture on Friday at um, 5, 5.30 or something like that, or 6 o'clock and the seminar um, in the, uh, on Saturday midday as a lunchtime seminar. So this will give you a bit of an idea. Uh, you can also uh, check the center's uh, uh, website for uh, videos and other information on what has been happening so far. Uh, there are other relevant centers uh, at SOAS. Uh, um, there's a Center for the Study of Japanese Religion. There's a very important Southeast Asian Institute and the Center for Yoga Studies. So these are all connected somehow with Buddhism. I think I'll stop here and uh, uh, see if there are other questions. I see that there is something on the Q&A. So this will, just to warn you, uh, Lucio, we need to kind of wrap up in the next uh, two, three minutes, but the, this will have to be the final question. Okay. Uh, and it says, uh, I'm interested in religious studies as well as gender studies, particularly Indian, Indian religious and religious texts. I'm finding it hard to choose an MA course. Can you offer any advice? Is there any flexibility in terms of choosing modules from different departments? Yes, there is. I, this is just as I was explaining, there is pretty much uh, flexibility. Um, so um, yes, if you would do the MA with the studies, you would be uh, looking at um, of choosing the courses on India, there is a religions of India, of ancient India course, and uh, um, yeah, uh, you can do Buddhist meditation in India, and you can build up the course. And if you are interested in the language, there's plenty of uh, um, learning uh, uh, on Sanskrit, or yeah, again, it depends on what specifically uh, you want to do, what kind of abilities you have, what is your background. So you can certainly build up what I call uh, your portfolio, say your, your course of study. Amazing. Uh, we're going to have to wrap it up there, guys, just because we've um, kind of come to the end of our lot of the time in the Zoom call. Uh, I'd like to say thank you very much to all the uh, panelists for speaking contributors again today and to the attendees for attending. It's been uh, really insightful to learn this this evening. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, if you do have any further questions, please do go to the website. Please do kind of 
seek us out. You can find all our contact details for the academics and ourselves if you'd like to raise any further questions. Like I said, our recording will be made available um, hopefully towards the end of this week, if not the beginning of next week, but we will make the recordings available to yourselves as well so you'll be able to make your informed decisions. Uh, thank you very much and have a lovely evening, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming and thank you, Hamish and Fahima, for being so helpful.